You are watching Prophetic Revelation TV. You're watching Prophetic Revelation TV. You are watching Prophetic Revelation TV. You're watching Prophetic Revelation TV. from um, this is prophet Gerard Yasuru welcoming you today to another episode um, of Q&A with uh, me the prophet prophet Gerard Yasuru and this is the prophetic Revelation TV we're gonna have an amazing time tonight as well as we take uh, your questions um, we've got some questions that we've been given that we're gonna try to provide answers for so get ready. If your friends are not yet connected, tell them to connect as soon as possible. You can share the link on your Facebook pages so that we can get more people to connect and we can reach to more people. Whatever questions you have, please send us the questions. And it's very important to understand that even Christ Jesus had sessions where he answered questions. Even the whole discourse in Matthew chapter 24, where we hear about you know, what will come, happen, what will happen in the end times, it was in response to questions. Uh, disciples came to him privately and asked him a question, can you tell us the signs of the end times? What shall happen? How it shall happen? And then Jesus had all this expose that he gave on eschatology. It was a response to a question that disciples gave him. So it's very important for us as well to be having these sessions where we take questions and we provide answers to those questions. So I'd like to welcome you and uh, I'm encouraging you to let your friends know that we are live again today uh, in this segment of Q&A with Prophet Jared Nyasuru on a Prophetic Revelation TV. And as we commence our program tonight, we're going to commence with a time of prayer. And as you know, we love to pray the prayer that Apostle Paul prayed for the church in Ephesians chapter 1 uh, from verse number 15, where it says, Wherefore I also, after that I heard of your faith in the, in the Lord Jesus and love unto the saints, says not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of Lord Jesus was the Father of God may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his natives in the sense, and what is the extreme greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ Jesus when he raised him, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and the power and the might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head of all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So we're going to pray that prayer today. Um, and after the prayer, we're going to begin to take our questions. So I want you just to form in this prayer. Say, O oh Lord, grant me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge. Flood my mind, flood the eyes of my spirit 
with your light. In Jesus' name. Come and make a prayer. Just lift up your voice wherever you are. Just make a prayer. Father, we thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, Jehovah. And Father, tonight we pray, grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, Father. Cause us, Father, to know the truth of your word, Father. Cause us, Father, to know the hope of your calling. Flood our minds, O oh God, with your light. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you praise. We give honor, give you glory. Our Father and our God, there's no God besides you alone and the living God. You alone are Jehovah, the Most High, the King of Kings. We thank you, Father. We bless you, Jehovah. As God, you saturate us. You fill us, O oh God, with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. As Father, you unveil the truth of your word. As Father, you unveil veil responses and answers to our questions. We thank you, Father, for a God who delights in revealing yourself to your children. We honor you. We glorify your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Someone said amen and amen. I would like to welcome you again to this segment, this program today um, of Q&A with Prophet Jad Nyasu right here on your own favorite TV channel, Prophetic Revelation TV. And before we commence to take um, the questions and provide the responses, we're going to take a short break, and then I'll be right back. If you need to grab a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, quickly make yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, grab it very quickly because I'll be back here in a few seconds. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Now, the first question that we'll take tonight um, is coming from Joy. Joy, you've got a question that you want us to respond to tonight. How do you honor difficult parents that don't make it easy for you to have a relationship with them? They abuse people in the household and don't have boundaries. <laughs> That's a that's a very, very powerful question, Joy. And um, I pray that um, God will help us to give you the right answers. You know, the whole scripture is coming from the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then verse number 2 says what? Honor your father and mother, okay? Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayst live long on earth. So the question was, what if those parents make it so hard for you to honor them and make it so easy for you to dishonor them? <laughs> All right. Now, I want you to understand the honor. Now, what is honor? Honor in the Greek simply means to prize or to put a fixed valuation upon a person. Put a fixed valuation upon a person. And this person here, we are talking about your father and your mother or your biological parents. Because in those portion of scripture, which I've just read, verse number one, it does not deal with your biological parents. It deals with your spiritual parents. The Bible says what? Obey. Children, obey. Okay, children, obey who? You obey your parents in the Lord. 
okay, for this is right. You obey your parents in the Lord. These are your spiritual parents, okay? These are your, your spiritual parents. And then verse number six goes to honor thy father and thy mother. These are now your biological parents. So honor, as I said, simply means to value or put a fixed evaluation upon them. So they are your parents. They gave birth to you. Okay, so they are valuable to your life. They are the source of your life in quotes and quotes, if you may understand the meaning of that word. So that does not change. Whether they whip you, they don't whip you, it doesn't change. Okay, because you put a fixed value on them. However, relationship is something which is reciprocal. It's not only one-sided, it's not only one way. If your parents are being abusive to you, it's very difficult and very hard, of course, as you're saying, to have a relationship with them because relationship is to relate. They relate to you, you relate to them. It's not one way. It's not that, okay, because I'm the child, then I'm the one to relate to them. No, because the very next verse there, verse number four, sheds more light. What does it say? And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath. Okay, you fathers. Now, how about your biological parents? provoke not your children to what? To wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So in other words, the parents as well, they are under obligation, okay, to relate with you in the right way. And the Bible says they need to bring you up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now the question becomes, if the parent is not doing that, are you still obliged to keep a fixed valuation on them? The answer is the valuation does not change, but the relationship changes, okay? The valuation does not change. They are your parents. They gave birth to you. That's the channel that God used for you to be who you are. But what changes is now the way you relate with them. Because if they are abusing you and you can find another place to live, you can go and live there. And you can tell them, you are still my parents. I still honor you as my father and my mother. But the way you are treating me, it's not going to work. Okay? You are abusing me. It's not going to work. Uh, the parents do not have that right to abuse their children. It's wrong. And if a child is able to find a place where they can live, then they can go live elsewhere. I'm, I'm, I live in Australia. My father is in Malawi. It doesn't mean that he abuses me. But what I'm saying is uh, when you grow up at a certain age, you don't need to live with them in the same house, in the, eating from the same plate. You can have your own house, your own plate to eat from. <laughs> you can only meet, say hi, hi dad, you know, that's it, from a distance. Hi mom, from a distance. They don't need to be in your hair. Aha, uh -huh. you know, you understand what I'm saying. That's why God gives you another set of parents called your spiritual parents. Because those ones, the spiritual parents, they are very loving, they are very caring. I'm telling you, they supplant the love that you are getting from your biological parents. So you are still covered in that context. We've got an uncle, a brother, you know, stay with them. If you are able to get someone to talk to them about the way they read with you if you're younger, that can help as well. Um, if things are getting out of hand, you've got authorities that you can speak to. It's also important. Don't continue suffering in silence because they're your parents who are abusing, abusing you. They are not uh, following what they ought to be doing when it comes to Parent, parental love or parenthood, uh, they are going wrong on that context. So I hope that sheds light on how you can relate with uh, those parents. We're going to take um, a short break and then I'll be back with uh, our next question tonight. Thank you.
welcome back, welcome back. This is Prophet uh, Gerard Nyasolo, and this is Q&A, uh, where you get a chance to ask your questions, and um, I respond to those questions. And welcome back to Prophetic Revelation TV tonight, um, where God is still speaking today. Now, I'm going to take a question from Sadeba, Sadeba Irakau. I don't know how you pronounce it anymore. I hope I've tried as much as I could. Sadeba, Irakau. You gave us a question that, Shalom, Papa, my question concerns the gift of speaking in tongues. Must everyone uh, be baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, speak in tongues? What must one do if they do not have that gift? All right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, um, Sadeba, for this wonderful question. Obviously, um, you've used the word baptized um, in the Holy Spirit. I, I will use it in a more simple way. I know they are quite, it's a quite a technical term. And sometimes people use that without knowing that they are talking about, to, they are referring to something different. You know, there is uh, three major dimensions of the Holy Spirit. There's not only one. The first measure or the first dimension of the Holy Ghost is what we call the earnest of the Spirit, okay? The earnest of the Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, okay, for you to understand the context, um, I'm going to read for you um, from verse number 13 going into verse number 14. The Bible says, Okay, in whom ye also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise after that you believed. Uh -huh. Which is what? Verse number 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption or the purchased possession unto the a praise of his glory. The key word there is earnest. All right. Now that word earnest, um, if you look at it, it's not necessarily a Greek word. It has got its origin in Hebrew. Okay. It's A double R H A B O N. Okay. So it's coming from a Hebrew word, uh, but they've been trans transliterated into Greek. It means a pledge, okay? It means part of the purchase money, okay? Or property given in advance as security for the rest. It's an earnest. It's a down payment. I think that's the most uh, common usage that we know, down payment. Or we call it a deposit, okay? It's a deposit. So if you want to buy something expensive, you tell the shop owner, um, I don't have all the money today, I'm going to finish paying off. They say, but can you give us a deposit to, for us to know that you are very, very serious about this purchase? So you give them a deposit, which is the earnest, which is the down payment. So in this context, the Holy Ghost is given to you as a down payment the moment you receive Jesus Christ. The moment you become born again, you are given a measure or the Holy Ghost, which is called a down payment. And the Bible calls that it's a seal. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. But that Holy Spirit is not the fullness of the Spirit. It's just a measure. And then we find another measure found in um, Acts chapter 2. Okay, Acts chapter 2 is a very good passage because we find it two different measures in that passage alone. Acts chapter 2 from verse number 1 all the way to verse number 4. From verse number 1 to 4, we find it two different measures there, okay? The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want you to notice there 
what's happening in verse number two. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So the house was filled. So the people were in the house, but the house was filled. So in courts and courts, they were baptized in what, was, what, what filled that house. Are you getting it? Aha. Uh -huh. The first there, they were, the whole house was filled, and they were inside the house. So they were literally baptized in what filled the house is that the house is filled with water and you are inside the water. It means you are baptized in that water. So we see here that we are seeing a baptismal. This is what we call the baptismal measure of the Holy Ghost. And then we find another measure, which is they were all filled, which is now in verse number four. And they were all filled. They were all filled. Now the people were filled. All right. So I'm going to give an illustration of my glass here. Um, I've got this uh, glass here. As you can see, this glass has got water in it all the way to here. Okay, I hope you can see. Now, there are two things. I can fill this glass all the way to the brim, but it doesn't mean that the glass has been baptized in water. The glass is only filled with water. But if I'm going to use that term being baptized, which means to be immersed, okay, to be immersed, it means I take the glass, immerse it in water, two things will happen. The glass will be filled with that water and then water will be all over the glass. Not only the glass is filled, but also the glass is in water. And that's what happened here in the book of Acts uh, chapter 2, that the first thing that happens is the whole house was filled with the Holy Ghost. They were inside the Holy Ghost, but then the, <laughs> the Holy Ghost entered them. It's like a person who is drowning, who doesn't know how to swim, you know. The first thing is the person is not filled with water, <laughs> but as time passes by, as he gasps for air, he will swallow water until water can't swallow him anymore. I'm just joking. But you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, the water will enter him and fill him completely, but the person will also be in the water, totally dipped into the water. So the total dipping is the baptismal. The infilling, when the water enters the person, is the filling dimension. Now, the question is not about that. The question is about tongues. I started from there so that you can understand that. If a person has got the earnest of the spirit, they do not speak in other tongues. The time the person begins to speak in other tongues when they have been filled with the Holy Ghost. When they have been filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, the baptismal measure, unfortunately, it's not something that most people have experienced because it's a totally different dimension. It's when it's, it's not only are you filled, but the Holy Ghost is carrying you. It's like that person back in the water. What happens after the person has swallowed enough water, they are dead. What happens? They begin to float on water. So the water carries the person. Okay, that's the, the person is filled with water, but then the water is also carrying the person. It's uh, the dimension where you need to fight for, you need to contend for that dimension. Because that's the ministry dimension, when it's not only you are filled, but the Holy Ghost is carrying you. Okay, that's the baptismal measure. So at what point does a person begin to speak in other tongues? It's when they have been filled with the Holy Ghost, and then they begin to speak in other tongues. I know that the Bible talks about the gift of tongues. There's a difference between the gift of tongues and tongues which come because you have been filled by the Holy Ghost. I know many times I've had many preachers, many churches, they combine the two into one thing and then they get entangled in different interpretations of scriptures. Hey, why do you speak in tongues and then there's no interpreter? Hey, what, what, what? They get entangled because they're trying to combine it, two different concepts into one and use two different sense of scriptures to mean one thing. And so it becomes crazy. But take it from me. In its simplest, in, in its simplest form, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and then you begin to speak with other tongues. Now, those tongues are not ministerial tongues. You're going to not go to preach in tongues. No. You will not come to talk to me in your tongues. No, I may understand them as a prophet, but ordinarily it's not meant to be like that. Those tongues are for you, for prayer, not for ministry, for prayer. It's a prayer language, and that's what the Bible refers to in Romans chapter 8, verse number 26 and verse number 27. The Bible says something that's very important. It says what? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. 
but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with the groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. It's a prayer language between you and God. It's not meant to be understood by anybody. No. But when you talk about the gift of tongues as a gift, is you, I don't know which part of the world you are coming from. Um, you are coming from one of the islands there. Um, is that Kiribati? Uh, somewhere there. Uh, I don't know. I don't know which island you come from. So, for example, you come from Kiribati, or you come from PNG, and then God sends you to Malawi to preach to Malawians. Okay? What will happen? When God sends you to Malawi to preach to Malawians, he gives you a gift of Chichewa. Well, that's the language of Malawians there, Chichewa. Now, what will happen with that language? When you speak Chichewa in your island, no one will understand you. They go, huh? What are you talking about? This is confused. This is confusing. So you can go to church, preach in Chichewa for five hours, and everyone will be walking away on you. They will walk away because that's madness. Okay? That's why they say you need an interpreter there because they are trying to preach to people using a gift of tongues of Chichewa to people who don't speak that language. You need an interpreter. But when you find yourself in Malawi, where you have never been before, you have never been taught the language, and then you are able to preach to them in their own mother tongue, you don't need an interpreter. They will understand exactly what you are talking about. And they will be so shocked to hear you speak in their mother tongue, and I assure you, they will become born again without even you sweating, without even you working hard. Why? Because it's a shock to them. They can see this is the hand of God. There's no way this person could ever speak this language. So what am I driving at? I'm driving at this simple principle that when we talk about a gift of tongues, don't confuse it with your prayer language which is given to you when you have been filled by the Holy Ghost. When you have been filled with the Holy Ghost, you are given a language which is a prayer language. That one is not a gift. The gift is the Holy Ghost that you received. But when he comes into you, he brings that prayer language with, along, alongside him. Okay. But then on top of that, that's where now you can receive a gift of tongues that you can go and use to speak to other people. But when you use that tongue to speak to people who don't understand you, you need an interpreter. But if you use that tongue to speak to people who understand you, you don't need an interpreter. And I think First Corinthians chapter 14 has tried to disentangle those two subjects because uh, the apostle Paul found himself in a snare where these people are asking him questions. Oh, exactly the que like the question that we're asking there. So if you go to First Corinthians chapter 14, um, let's just read from verse number 1 to verse number 5 uh, because of time. Okay. The Bible says, For after chat and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an own tongue, watch this, for he that speaketh in an own tongue, uh -huh. what does the Bible say? For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, uh -huh. but who? But unto God, for no man understandeth him. How bad in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. This is now your prayer language. Okay. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an own tongue, okay, edifieth himself, but he him, but he that prophesieth edifies the church. I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with the tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive a defying. So you see that the apostle is he is hitting the two sides. There are tongues for ministry. You need an interpreter. And then there are tongues for prayer. Those ones, you only talk to God. No man understands. You see the apostle is hitting both sides. Is it in both sides? We're dealing with tongues for prayer and tongues for ministry. Tongues for prayer, you speak to God. No man understandeth you. Skip it there. Okay? But tongues for ministry, if you speak Russian, if you speak Malawian, then you know God is calling you to that nation where people can understand your language. When you are there, you do not need any interpreter. Everyone will understand exactly what you are talking about. I hope you have received some light um, on that question. We're going to take a break, and then we'll be back with uh, probably one or two more uh, questions. Thank you.
Welcome back. And fortunately, our time is up. As you know that we tried to keep the, uh, this program uh, to just half an hour. So our time is up for tonight. But I'll give you a bonus question and a bonus answer. I'll pick one which is very, very short. Okay. Uh, what? <laughs> How do we pray without ceasing? You know, the Bible says pray without ceasing. The Bible says we pray without ceasing. And the question says what? How do we pray without ceasing? You pray without ceasing. That's the answer. <laughs> the Bible says pray without ceasing. So how do you pray without ceasing? When you are praying without ceasing, then you are praying without ceasing. <laughs> I know you're thinking, oh my God, what is the prophet talking about? I know what you mean. I know. Why? Because you associate prayer with the, a time when you shut down everything, stop everything, and then you go into your closet. You pray, 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 pray for 20 minutes. Hmm, I finished. You walk out of there, prayer's finished. No. Praying without ceasing simply means your 20 minutes. When you come out, you walk into your shower. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You shower. Hi, uh, morning, princess. How are you? Uh, how, was your, how was your night? It was fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hey, you. Do it. Do, do, do. You give instructions to your children, your brothers, your sisters. You talk to them. The moment you finish talking to them, engage back in your prayer. You are driving to work. It takes you 45 minutes. What happens? 45 minutes of time to pray. You can engage in prayer. You don't need to, you know, stop every pack your car by the sides of the road. Pray. <laughs> you, you, you'll not make it work. They'll fire you. <laughs> so praying without ceasing is when you are constantly engaged in prayer. The other times when you're not doing the other things. Aha, uh -huh, now it's making sense. So you will not go into your body meeting with your boss. And they said the Bible says I have to pray without ceasing. And then they are discussing there, they will fire you. In fact, they will take you to a mental hospital. I'm telling you, <laughs> we'll have to come and bury out of that mental hospital. <laughs> Convince them that you're okay. So praying without ceasing is when you constantly engage in a prayer when you are not doing other things. We know that you sleep. But you see, when you sleep, your spirit is active. Your spirit can engage in prayer even when you are fast asleep. That's why sometimes you wake up praying. You wonder what happened. It's because your spirit is awake. Your spirit was engaged in prayer. So just develop a habit. Um, other those down times, you know, thinking nonsense, talking about nonsense, look, going on Facebook, throwing down, watching nonsense. Why can't you spend that time in prayer? Number two, prayer doesn't have to be audible. You can pray under your breath where people don't hear you. You know, there are times when I'm praying in the car, I see that people in those cars, they're looking at me going, Ooh, what is he doing? <laughs> Come in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. But nowadays they can put up with you while because they think you're talking. You know, there's audio in your car. They think you're talking on hands-free. So they think it's okay. Something is still okay up there. Otherwise, 
If there wasn't that, they would be thinking, hey, what happened to that guy in that car? <laughs> so praying without ceasing is when you take your opportunity, whatever opportunity you find yourself, whether you're just walking, uh, going to do exercises, you can be praying. Um, you come back there, you're in your shower, you know, you can be praying. Most of you, you are worship leaders in the shower. You sing songs. You know, you're taking a shower. There's something about taking a shower and singing. It seems the two, they go together. Most of you, you do that. So you can even pray there. Um, you can pray in the kitchen as you're cooking. You can pray as you're cleaning the house. It's just a habit that you develop to engage in prayer. So don't um, compartmentalize your prayer life. Compartment to her. You put a compartment of your prayer life here, and when you're finished, I'm done today. I've done my 20 minutes. I'm done today. No. At your break time at work, you can pray as you're eating. As you're eating, you're praying under your breath. We have, you are not disturbing what is happening. We have to be orderly. We have to be people who are so orderly. So for tonight, this is what I had for you uh, because of time. Our public enemy number one in Streams International is called what? Time. We never run out of revelation. We only run out of time. That's all. So that's why for tonight, this is where we end our program. And I'll be swinging again um, in the next episode of Q&A with Prophet Gerard Nyasuru. So this is Prophet Gerard Nyasuru right here on your favorite TV channel, Prophetic Revelation TV, saying... <music>